Welcome to our uh, Washington Roundtable series. Um, I'm Walter Isaacson. And um, because I wandered in, because I wanted to see Liz Diller, Damien, who has this theory that I don't do much work around here, <laughs> said, could uh, I introduce uh, Damien uh, and Liz, of course. but. Uh, Damien runs our arts program at the Aspen Institute. Um, he's taken on multiple roles since uh, he retired as principal dancer of the City Ballet. But the most important is making sure the Aspen Institute connects arts to all that we do. Uh, and w by doing that, it's not just a program about the arts. It's about the citizen artists and connecting art to our lives. There's no better person to be speaking on that than Elizabeth Diller. Um, sometimes architecture doesn't connect well with us. Sometimes it does as when Lincoln Center was built. It was a great connection. But even then it could be made better. And every now and then I walk up the steps that Liz and others did to reconnect even better Lincoln Center. And you can see what the, ar what the connection of architecture to human life can be done when done right. We all have to really push hard that it's a Hirshhorn, right, where the bubble's going to be. Make sure that nobody backtracks on the bubble and the Hirshhorn that she's doing. She uh, invented almost a new art form of public life, which was the High Line, as she's been the artist in residence at the Aspen Institute. And have I earned my salary yet, Damien? <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, as Walter said, it is central, uh, certainly, to uh, to my life, but also I would say it's central to the Institute and has been for all of its years. Uh, and with renewed effort, we're looking at how the arts actually fit into society and actually play a meaningful role beyond simply being enlightening or inspiring. It's actually about how we live and how we want to live and how we want generations in the future to live. Uh, and as uh, Walter also said, there's nobody more central in this general conversation and my friend Liz Diller, and I'm so grateful that she joined us here today to talk about what public spaces are today, what they can be. Uh, Walter referenced Lincoln Center. This is where I danced for 23 years with New York City Ballet. And Liz's Lincoln Center is a very different animal than the, the Lincoln Center I danced in. And it's an appropriate change because it went with the timing. It's with the type of, the type of thinking that was going into the works of art and about the, the people who wanted to be there or maybe didn't know about it or knew that they were welcome or knew what was possible for them. And that's what this is all about. So I'm going to just turn it over to Liz right now. She has a, a presentation where she's going to show some of the works and then we'll, we'll have a conversation and finish with some question and answers uh, towards the end uh, of the lunch hours. All right, so uh, Liz, please welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, Damien, and thank you, Walter. Um, very happy to be here. I'm going to just whip through um, a bunch of slides and, um, and op open up the conversation with Damien and, and all of you. Um, and I want to start with, um, actually, with uh, uh, Lincoln Center very quickly. And, and just to say that, that Lincoln Center came at a certain point in our life about 10 years ago, um, and it was just following the heels of a um, of an exhibition installation um, in a porno theater on 42nd Street. It was a media piece, and it was when we were acting kind of as subversive artists. Um, all of a sudden, we were invited into the center um, to really rethink the space, and the project grew uh, from a very small um, uh, tra transition uh, piece to, um, uh, to work done all over the 16-acre campus. Um, this is the way we um, like to remember Lincoln Center, uh, this archive image. This is actually what we, um, what we encountered when we came there, um, very much around services, uh, travertine, solid bases, solid walls. Um, and it turned its back on the community and was severed uh, from the city, very much the product of, of 50s megablock planning. Um, these are this, these are the guys that uh, that did it initially. Uh, there's a lot of testosterone there. Um, we took over and we took a very very different um, uh, position here. We worked all over the campus. We tried to um, uh, create a new language there that was um, aggregate but also synthetic. Um, 
And um, I'm just going to show you a couple of before and afters very quickly. The Juilliard uh, building. There was a lot of historic sensitivity around Lincoln Center. Uh, we expanded uh, Juilliard School by 55,000 square feet. Also t t totally changed the entrance to Tully Hall, uh, which remained in place, but all of a sudden became very public. This is the Broadway side of the same extension. Um, the view into this very, very large now celebratory lobby, which uh, really had no place before. An equal measure to interior uh, public space and exterior public space. Um, and then uh, during intermission. Uh, and we welcome crowds uh, all day. Um, at the same time, this, this lobby space is used for performances. Um, we also did a lot of facilities stuff, um, the whole uh, transformation of the um, theater in Lincoln Center. I won't get into to that stuff. The Juilliard School is one of the great conservatories in the country, um, and this was the entrance on the, uh, on the plaza. There really was nothing there, um, so we made a, a really nice, um, uh, again, a kind of... Uh, very public entrance uh, and matched the monumental scale of the building with a monumental stair, but one that really is a piece of furniture and a hangout. Um, this is the adjacency to uh, to Columbus uh, to um, uh, Columbus Avenue, and this is really like we like to think of this as the entrance to Lincoln Center, the main entrance. Um, so after you cross 11 lanes of traffic, then you go across the sidewalk, up the little steps, then you get run over by two more lanes of traffic. <laughs> we depressed that road, which was uh, uh, the patrons um, wanted to maintain that road um, uh, to be able to get uh, black car drop-offs, but we put it uh, down to the concourse level, so allowing curbside drop-off and entrances um, just uh, people on foot, people coming from the subway, um, and then matched the very large scale, the monumental scale of Lincoln Center again, uh, but this time with this very, very thin uh, Port Cochere bridge um, that is also filled with media. So it's dematerialized and monumental, but demonumentalized. Um, and then just some more images of uh, trying to keep some of the um, very sensitive areas kind of similar but very different. Uh, this is the North Plaza before and after, um, a new public space now, um, trying to make good on the publicness of public spaces in Lincoln Center. Um, and this is a new destination restaurant uh, whose, uh, whose roof is, uh, is, is kind of a, gra a meadow, kind of an urban bucolic space that we like to think of. Um, below is the, is the restaurant with an open kitchen, and then above this space, which kind of... Uh, uh, just pointed toward the uh, reflecting pool and very peaceful. Um, also performances happen uh, all over the place. Um, so this is the street uh, with that 200 foot long Milstein bridge um, demolished and now replaced with a very small pedestrian bridge. Um, the street is filled with media and uh, and it's it's really moving along. This is, uh, you know, at, uh, if Maybe we'll analyze this someday. This is just, any one of the people on here could put themselves in the middle of this, and the complexity of the stakeholders, the, um, you know, all of the, the Lincoln Center players, uh, the city, the state, uh, the historic preservation folks, all of the teams, the consultants, it was really, really crazy. We're right in the middle of all of that. Um, I also wanted to flash by the High Line, which is another uh, really important project for us in New York. Uh, it's a mile and a half stretch of uh, uh, just a defunct um, urban um, infrastructure. We were very much stimulated by the way nature conquers culture, conquers nature, con conquers culture in those cycles. Um, so over the last uh, something like seven, eight years, we've been working on, on this project. Um, uh, two of the three phases um, are open to the public. The third one is being worked on, and uh, many of you might have already seen it. Uh, but it's very, very simple. It's just simply taking this infrastructure um, and with a very light architectural touch um, and a kind of uh, rethinking about the relationship between plants, paving, seating, lighting, and just some things like that uh, really made a kind of un uh, otherworldly space that works 
that, that focuses on looking backwards and forwards at the same time, uh, reusing um, some of the uh, industrial infrastructure for new, new purposes, and just some of the atmospheres that are on the High Line, again, with some very, very light touches, was already there. We pride ourselves in not having screwed it up. Um, this is one of the spurs. We simply uh, made a kind of depressed area to look out over traffic. Um, and these are all the high lines that are in progress right now. There are more, actually, since this slide was up. And this um, uh, idea, even though it, there was one that preceded the high line in Paris, um, didn't get much attention. This one really um, gave a lot of uh, uh, city administrations the idea that, um, that maybe infrastructure can be repurposed. Um, no, no place can be like the High Line, though, because the super juxtapositions are just out of this world. Um, on the High Line, at the very northern edge, we have uh, um, been part of a team to create a very new institution. Um, and it prides itself in being unbranded. Um, it's in multidisciplinary, visual arts, performing arts, um, and creative industry. Um, very, very flexible. It can change in scale and is financially self-reliant. It's called the Culture Shed. Um, and one of its distinctive features is that it's three levels of galleries, very large scale, about uh, 14,000 square feet each level. But it has a deployable shed that doubles its footprint. And it uses gantry crane technology. And um, this animation shows you it docks into a tall building. Um, literally, it moves on wheels. Um, all the glass surfaces open up, and you can have expansive spaces, and also very, very tall space. Um, this is something that we felt that New York needed, um, and the city agreed, and it's happening. It's at the very, it's on 30th Street, um, and it's uh, just around 11th Avenue. Uh, and just a very, very quick uh, view of just a couple of other relevant projects. The Boston ICA that was built uh, at Fan Pier, an old industrial site. It was a museum that we did in 2006 with a really uh, a very important uh, kind of approach to public space. It gives up part of its footprint. Um, at street level, at grade, to actually uh, expand its footprint over public space to create a very large gallery. Um, this is that public space that's given over at the harbor um, for um, all sorts of things, just for hanging out, looking at the water, to lar large events. This happens to be um, a viewing of a high diving uh, championship off of the building. This is really fun. Um, and just some, some views um, that show our um, we're very interested in the way buildings meet sites and take advantage of sites here, turning it way off, and here just framing it in one of the spaces for media. Um, another project that we're uh, just coming out of the ground is in Rio de Janeiro, right in Copacabana Beach. Um, this is a city we think of on a kind of uh, as a kind of glamorous place, um, but it's actually it's it has great urbanization problems. Um, and the beach is one of the only places um, that's truly democratic where um, high-low come together. And um, this is the site of this new uh, museum, of the Museum of the uh, Cultural History of Rio. Um, the stimulation actually comes from the avenue uh, and, uh, and basically uh, taking that pattern of burly marks and kind of folding the whole building out of the sidewalk, out of the street. And so um, it captures all of the uh, spaces, all of the uh, uh, galleries, and all the way up to the roof. And this is a little diagram of how we did it. And so you could come off the beach, take a shower, um, go up the building, watch a movie, have a drink. Um, or you can go in and out of the museum in construction. And then the last thing I wanted to show was um, actually the project that we're doing here in. Uh, uh, right on the National Mall at the Hirshhorn, and uh, it's a very interesting and um, you know very uh, it's a, it's a great problem for an architect because lo uh, architects love and hate this building at the same time. Most of the public hates it, um, but it actually is a really really interesting building on the mall, and um, 
um, the big question was, um, you know, in the lineup of, of uh, museums and institutional buildings on the Mall, um, how do you really partake of the energy of Washington? Um, there are 400 um, embassies and think tanks uh, all over Washington. Why not have art participate in, um, um, in, in all of this activity, and why not grab it and have it uh, as part of its brain trust um, to think about um, uh, uh, cultural diplomacy and so forth? Um, the buildings on the Mall are very solid. Um, this building is made of air, um, and we. this is the... Um, the little video that we showed Richard Koshalik, um to get the project. And it was um, just a bag from the um, dry cleaners. And <laughs> he just said, that's it. That's perfect. Let's go with it. And um, in fact, um, we developed this. And we thought of it very much as inhaling the democratic air of the mall. Uh, and you know, we <laughs> just and we felt that that the mall needed something exuberant like this, and something that um, kind of plays with the sight, plays with a kind of solidity, is exuberant and is optimistic, mm -hmm. and brings people together. Um, it oozes out of the side because the space is not quite big enough in the hole. And then, of course, we sold it as contributing to the to the domes on the mall. Um, and this is the the space, and it's really a kind of forum for public discussion and debate, as well as uh, as a place that artists can take over. Okay, that's it. Thank you. That's a, just a whirlwind tour, and there's much more. There we mean many other projects that relate to the individual spaces. I was thinking specifically of the Blur Building, which we've talked about, which was a theater of the air, I like to think. Oh, there it is, in <laughs> fact. Um, just tell us about that one quickly. Yes, Damien, Damien asked me to this is a favorite of mine, so keep me that. I, I, well, he only gave me like 10 minutes to, to do a show, but um, <laughs> it was great to fit this one in. Uh, this was a, uh, a project that was done in between our art careers and our architecture careers um, in Switzerland, at, in Neuchâtel, for the Expo 2002. And, um, and basically, uh, the building is made out of water. Um, we simply, we take the water of the lake and we pump it through 35,000 um, high pressure uh, nozzles, uh, fog system, and create a cloud that is um, basically regulated by a smart uh, system that's reading the, the temperature, the wind, velocity, and so forth. And it's producing a space, it's about um, the length of a football field, uh, about 300 feet, and about 75 feet off the, off the surface of the lake. This is one of those um, nozzles. And it creates this big fog bank, um, and the public comes into it, and you're entirely disoriented. We thought that in the, uh, in the context of expos, where high fidelity and uh, they're super saturated with uh, with media installations um, and simulation is all, uh, all the rage. We thought of making a low def space um, where you came in and there's actually nothing to see and nothing to do, except wander around and think about our dependence on vision. Um, and at the very top, there is a, a bar that serves all the waters of the world. So you can, you can breathe the building, you can drink the building. Um, it um, totally connects up with the with the real weather. And this is the way it feels as you come up. And, uh, whoops. On the right is um, the way it feels inside, you can see. People just coming in and out of uh, focus. It uh, well, it was done for this for the summer months, and it was just about 15 degrees cooler than the outside, and there was a very light mist. Um, we developed um, a kind of raincoat called the brain coat, which had 
which had, which had intelligence in it. We were never able to realize it. But there's a light mist, and uh, so people got these little garbage bags to put over themselves. Okay, so that, that, that's a kind of the latitude. Our work uh, goes in very uh, different directions where uh, we also do, uh, we, we curate shows and we also um, are doing uh, experimental uh, projects in, in, uh, in dance and theater and, uh, and also doing two operas now. Wow. Yeah. So you said that when my, my work or our work, uh, because we should talk about the fact that it's uh, Dolores Scafidio, Renfro, yes. they're partners, it's a revolutionary partnership that spans art to architecture. But I would also add to that citizenship, because so much of what you do is about partaking, about how people partake. And citizenship in the terms, in, in, my, in my vernacular, means, uh, means partaking, having the, the, the right to partake in something, having the opportunity, and you know, giving that, that focus. And it seems to me that that's a huge part of what you do, as opposed to just get an idea and make something. Uh, and can you comment a little about, you know, how that relates to, let's say, in the High Line, you know, you, you discovered what's there and you, you capitalize on it. Or Lincoln right. Center, you, you look at it probably for a long time and try and imagine uh, what's there. Do you, do you, is there polling in a sense that goes on? Are you, or, or is, it, is it internal? I mean, are you, you go to people and you... Uh, you know, I, I think I have, just to, to go back to the, our roots, which are more independent artwork that was very much self-generated. Uh, we, we found sites, we went for uh, funding, um, we, there were, everything was really independent and autonomous. Uh, it really defined uh, being the kind of outside dissidents. Mm -hmm. And then, and then when we started to kind of make a change, we, it was at a moment that um, I think there were many, um, uh, th there were many great things that kind of conspired to, uh, uh, to the outcome. And part of that was that uh, we were very open. Uh, a lot of people in our generation were starting to become leaders of institutions. And um, we started to think about, well, you know, if we're invited to the ICA, for example, uh, to be the architects, we can't exactly lob grenades at the institution, the art, uh, the, the museum institution. Um, the same thing. Um, the Bloomberg administration was um, was uh, really starting to think about the city and public space, and was very much civically oriented. Um, we um, at that point, when we were asked to look at Lincoln Center, at the very beginning, we thought this is really crazy. We're probably not right, the right people here because there's so much. Um, there are so many meetings, there are so many people to convince, there's so much consensus building, um, how could we possibly do it? Frank Gehry was there just before us and he did not have a successful project and he said to us, stay away from Lincoln Center, <laughs> don't get anywhere near there, they're, they're evil, they're everything, you know, efforts will collapse. And we, I, I think we thought of that as a kind of great challenge and so we went in and had we known what that would have been like, you know, at the, you know, we would have, we, we, we only succeeded because we were naive. So, um, and because of that, we were optimistic and we put ideas out and we shared those ideas and it was very, very, very hard work. Um, and in the end, um, you know, we, the, you know that, that catchphrase when you, um, like, you know, this, this is like 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. We're complaining about just that, and then we realized that that 99% was just as creative as the 1%. And that was like a total paradigm shift for us, mm -hmm. that uh, being involved, kind of putting yourself in the center of the discussion, working with um, various constituencies, trying to understand other points of view, stepping into other shoes. Um, and um, if you have an idea, not, not compromising it, but being able to explain it in different ways, um, was it really changed the way we work. And the High Line was pretty much parallel to that. But it was, there was no institution of the High Line. There were a couple of young guys that just, citizen activists that, that um, also happened to coincide with a great uh, administration, uh, the mayoral administration, and there was an effort to save the High Line after it was slated for demolition with the Giuliani yeah. administration. Um, and, and I would just, you know, um, fast forward to the present where we were very much inspired uh, by the notion of being citizen act activists and we put forward the idea of the culture shed. 
to the city, and then it took, um, and we're actively working on that now with a great group of collaborators. So we started off by being totally against the system, you know, and then we stepped into it, and then we realized that um, we had more agency than we thought we did. And and so part of that it really just comes from the heart. It, we're, we, we live in New York. We wanted to see great things happen uh, in New York. And um, and and the, and all the stars were in alignment. Um, and when we go to other parts of the world, and we're, we are building different parts of the world, we also see that um, it's a different kind of investment. And uh, architects typically receive programs. Architects uh, typically don't put things on the table. And we like to think of ourselves as, uh, you know, in a more leadership uh, kind of uh, position where we could put things on the table, try to test them, and uh, and see if we can realize things that have not been conceived before. It seems like you haven't had a lot of uh, examples from what I'm, what I'm seeing of people thinking, oh my god, this is just too far out for us, or is that a misconception? Because what you're talking about in some ways, um, I, uh, Heather and I, my wife Heather, uh, mm -hmm. ballerina, and educator talked about Balanchine institutionalizing his revolution. And what you're talking about is revolutionizing institutions in, right. in many cases, which is not obviously, you thought, oh, I don't know if they will. But is that true? Has there been a lot of pushback? Uh, yeah. I, I think it's not, it's never easy uh, to do it. I mean, all those uh, meetings, as you said, <laughs> it's a lot of consensus building. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, in this day and age, it's raising money. I mean, mm -hmm. that's um, just to get people around a cause, make make everyone understand that it's that it's important. Mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln Center, um, aside from all the political uh, stuff and getting all of the constituent organizations to agree, and you know that there's a governance there where um, there has to be total uh, u unanimity to make any change in public space of 12 organizations, each with their artistic directors and their boards and you know all the other people that are um, uh, stakeholders in those organizations. Um, you, you, you basically, you know, you, you have to po um, post something that actually people feel it's it, it, to their benefit. And in the case of Lincoln Center, where everyone was concerned about their own box office and no one was concerned about the campus, mm -hmm because nobody really owned it. Um, it. It was to convince people that what was good for the campus was good for their box office. Um, and then, um, you know, we're kind of, we live in a culture of philanthropy in the US, and I think we're very lucky, um, you know, but to raise the money for, for all of that, it was very, very hard work. And I think the um, administration of Lincoln Center did a really gr terrific job. So it wasn't us, but what I think we did was we, um, we show them that space can make a difference, and um, and that's I think what we do in a lot of institutional contexts, like educational contexts as well, um, that like to just repeat the same old program, the same old way, and space can make the difference to education, to uh, to to um, people learning uh, and teaching differently, and so you really have to get deep inside of the program. Um, so it's not a vision from God. It's not, you know, just a, a a formal idea. You know, a lot of architects come with a kind of formal agenda. Um, it's not like that for us. It's learning um, uh, the, you know, the, the 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 client and the site very very well. It's doing a deep analysis. It's having like really deep conversations about um, aspirations. It's it's putting our ideas also on the table, which might contribute to to the building of those aspirations and how space could convert those aspirations into form. And it doesn't always work out that those spatial ideas are either affordable or desirable. Um, and then we work it out. Um, you know, the way we work is not monolithic. It's, it's really dirty and nasty and, and complex and, um, you know, and it involves many, many iterations to get things to really kind of match up to all the circumstances. How do you um, feel about how people use your spaces? I mean, it's, you can start in New York because it's easiest in a sense, whether it's the High Line or Lincoln Center. We've talked, you and I, about Lincoln Center. Um, when Occupy Wall Street tried to go to Lincoln Center, they weren't allowed on the, on the plaza. So yeah. there was a, a non-public <laughs> aspect there. But even that was public in its own way. I mean, I felt uh, Phil Glass came down and spoke to them on those stairs. And right. uh, there was a 
references to Satyagraha, which was at the Met, and the whole thing had a, a communal sense, even though the, the institution itself yeah. was separate. I mean, right. I mean, that was uh, totally shocking to us, actually, <laughs> because we, we um, prided ourselves in, in, um, in having created all this public space that was truly public um, for all the um, cultural programming and for, for leisure. Um, we really wanted to have a destination. Uh, those public spaces um, should be a place that people go to, even if they can't afford $300 tickets to the Met, right? And was it, that the, the unifying principle that got the 12 constituents to say, yes, we want people to come here in the end because it will affect our box offices? I, I think that... The self-serving preservation <laughs> type <of> thing. I, <laughs> you know, I, th I think that that was, that was surely a part of it. It was part of the comprehension that, hey, these spaces all around us could also be nice and people, our own patrons could, could spend time there. They could, they could buy drinks someplace and they could hang out there and they could spend more time. Um, I think that it was, there was also a kind of civicness around the, uh, the client in, in general. And it was just, someone just needed to tell them that it was the right thing to do. You know? And before that, it was, it was architecture didn't really represent um, specifically unifying the campus uh, or really changing it up. Um, it, it was a product of, of the 50s and 60s planning, um, which was about exclusivity. And um, the, the socio-political conditions really changed drastically over those 50 years. And the people that were running these institutions, the new artistic directors, really had a different idea. Um, and, it, and we had a different idea. Um, so uh, making Lincoln Center relevant um, for the future is not, it's, a, it's one thing that you want to do at the, uh, uh, with the programmers, the artistic uh, programming, but it's something you also want to do um, to kind of fix uh, some of these problems that were really created when it was, uh, when it was designed and built. And, and that, was a, that was a big deal. And I think everyone realized that, um, that a new set of principles was in order for and for the future of Lincoln Center. Yeah, just a general acknowledgement that, I mean, I would think that when Lincoln Center was first conceived, it was a place everybody imagined that people would go. Mm -hmm. And the art, the art forms that were being ensconced there all were uh, in various stages of development in the middle of the 20th century, of, of, but of growth, essentially. I mean, City Valley at State Theater, that one was actually built for the World's Fair. Right. which is an amazing story uh, yeah. itself. It's a bit of a scam, but it's how it, how it got <laughs> built. Uh, and then Balanchine took it over, and it became his house, uh, well, the Matt and then Avery Fisher. But I, I remember at certain moments thinking that they, they started uh, in the, in the pre-DSR era hanging banners mm -hmm. where, there, where heretofore there were not, really, on the buildings themselves. And they tended to say something to the effect of so-and-so once worked here. Um, it was like Balanchine was here, and Bernstein was over there, and you know, it just went on and on. And what's happened now, it seems to me, is much more of an embrace of the present, uh, an attempt to say, no, it's happening now, it's happening here, uh, with the exception of Occupy, it's not happening mm -hmm. here. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's, to me, a push at the art forms themselves. Um, and I, I like to think, I, I wonder if you, if you if you in, engage in that thinking yourself. I mean, I remember the first time I worked in Alice Tully, that those, the walls she built in Alice Tully, they glow mm -hmm. and they, they change. And that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon when you're directing something because you realize there's more to it than what you're putting on the stage. It's not only, you know, what's there. There's other focuses. There's other ways to, to win mm -hmm. uh, in, in the theater itself. So do you, do you think about how you're going to affect the art forms, I guess, whether it's in the, the context of a performing arts center is one thing, but also the museums you work in? Yes, yeah. No, that's, a, that's a really good um, question. That there's, there is um, a very strong relationship between spaces and the art that's made for spaces. And we talk about this all the time. And when we think about, for example, Culture Shed, um, well, this is a huge grand space and also large um, uh, spaces for uh, gallery spaces. Um, what's the relationship between the art forms of the future and the spaces for the, for art of the future, and how can you possibly forecast that? And when you think back at like so much of the uh, groundbreaking work that was done in the 70s in the visual arts and performing arts happened out of lofts, 
and it was only because lofts were cheap and artists um, took over lofts and, uh, and industrial buildings were just kind of um, ready for the wrecking ball and cultural institutions started taking, taking them over. And, and so we, we um, became very, very kind of comfortable and familiar with these kind of undefined spaces um, that were hand-me-downs. Um, and the question is, if you're going to build from scratch, how do you do that? How do you replicate the feel that you have of those kind of unscripted spaces that you can take over without inhibition, that don't feel like institutions? Something that we think about all the time for the visual arts. Um, and you know, I mean, that there are there are a lot of really complicated issues around performance. Um, you know, we come from a uh, from a kind of a, a history of frontal performance, proscenium. Um, you know theaters, and um, when you when you think forward into performance, um, well, what should it be? So culture shed it doesn't know. It's just a big space, and it's actually like the best thing you can do: just carve out a piece of space and say, okay, this is protected, and you could use it any way you want to. You could use the first twelve feet. You could use a hundred feet. Um, but the fact is that when you produce new work um, and you wanted to tour, uh, there aren't that many large spaces that can be reconfigured the way uh, culture shit can be. And so you end up, a lot of artists um, end up working for proscenium theaters because that's the only way to, to circulate work all over the world. And, and so the, I, you know, what, I'm, what I'm saying, I guess, is that it's very important to, um, to imagine forward, but at the same time, we're very much, um, you know, we're, we're uh, Kind of restrained in many ways um, by the spaces that are already available, and uh, you know that that are uh, for for the circulation of a newly produced work. Um, the you know in the case of Tully, we inherited a space and we couldn't change the bones of that space. Th therefore, the stage stays where it is, the balcony stays where it is, the boxes stay where they are. But we entirely changed the acoustics and the feel of that space and made it intimate and uh, made it feel entirely different. So I think a lot of you know, people that would come in there would say, this is a brand new space. But it's actually, we worked within 18 inches from the uh, block walls and the structure that was there. That was yeah. the frame was the frame. That was yeah. it. Well, you made it, you know, what's interesting is you made it adaptable. And I noticed even the, on the, you know, when I walk on the High Line or I look at the photos and you think about how, you know, those chairs roll. But there was some, some obviously extreme restrictions on the High Line about what one could do or couldn't do. And I know you imposed yourself restrictions on, on things about the, the, the natural, the fauna that was there and what would stay and how you would preserve that and create a... a uh, a sacred space, I think, yeah. within the city, a little bit. Well, little when we, we 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 competed for that project with uh, several other uh, architects, interna international architects, um, and what we put forward very very strongly was um, um, that the Highline was not um, it was not the street, so you couldn't really have cafes or bookshops or that would that's not the thing to do. What you want to do is preserve the kind of strangeness, this otherworldliness. Um, that came into being when the High Line, uh, uh, you know, was in ruin. Right after 1980, it stopped being used for uh, for trains, and so all this kind of crazy weeds started to grow and trees, and it, it uh, all these little micro environments started to grow there with its own flora and fauna, which we, you know, ultimately we had to strip away and detoxify the whole site and then put back, uh, but in a different way, translated. Um, but so we won the competition based on it's. There are certain things you really shouldn't do. You don't want to replicate the street, um, and all you um, <laughs> there are signs all over. You you really you're not supposed to throw balls. You can't bring your bike up. You can't do rollerblades. You no you really, dogs. No dogs. I um, mean, you basically can. You can stand. You can walk. You can sit. You could stand. Um, and you know, and New Yorkers realize that wow, this is like a whole new idea about <laughs> existence in New York. We can walk um, and and promenade and and hang out. Um, and we we like to think about it as the discovery of doing nothing. Um, New Yorkers are always doing something. You know, you're always filling your time by going to the gym or you know uh, when you're not working and in between you're doing your device. When you come to the High Line, you, you actually make a commitment to do nothing for a while. And, um, and I think that's why it took, um, because it was novel. It is. I mean, that moment 
when you discover like the the sunken theater and you mm -hmm. can just sit and watch the traffic go by it's it's a, it's a different it's very it's somehow akin to you know a little bit of saturday afternoon on the porch and Hey, that's a Rhode Island license plate. There's, you know, it kind of goes by, and there's that feeling. And I was gonna, you know, it's just you set it up too perfectly that I had to say it's Seinfeld ended too soon. Obviously, uh, it would have been a natural place for doing nothing, um, a show about nothing where you're supposed to do nothing. Um, well, it's, you know, a new, it's a new kind of fireplace or Zen, you yeah. know, it's a Zen place. Yes, so. you know. Uh, I was going to go back a little bit to about the revolutionary aspects of architecture in general. So Ai Weiwei has said that he became a dissident essentially when he started engaging in architecture, because that's when he started engaging with the Chinese government, I guess, and the, the, the things that went on in that process really changed him uh, into something that I think we could all say, if you look at the art, was already there, but uh, it, it went to a, a, an extreme place. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that, it seems to me, you, you were already there, you were a revolutionary, you're an artist, you think like an, uh, an artistic mentality, but then you thought, how can I be a part of things, as opposed to, how can, uh, you, you use mm -hmm. the word your agency, you realized mm -hmm. you had more agency than you thought. Mm -hmm. um, when you work in foreign countries, for instance, compared to when you work in the United States, are, are there some extreme parallels, whether it's in Switzerland, trying to convince people you're going to create a steam building to, uh, to the museum in, in, uh, in Rio? Um, you know, I, we have never really found um, uh, any problems that are un insurmountable in all of our and, projects. And you have worked in China, too, or you're, yeah. you're in yeah. planning in China. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, you're we're working. Yeah. We're working in China. Um, and uh, no, we have, uh, but we've also uh, aligned ourselves with, with people that are really interested in making change. Um, in the in the case of uh, um, uh, you know just this is because this is up I'll just just a very uh, short story we proposed this um, and and it's not it's not inexpensive um, the the first you know while really? the artistic <laughs> but while the artistic team said this is great we want to do it um, when it came back to the more of the government authorities they said why would we build um, fog. We already have fog um, <laughs> all over the place, and it's unwanted. And we had to convince them that this was going to be a unique uh, moment. It's not just regular fog. It's it's the lake. It's appreciation of the site. It's appreciation of space and um, and, and and kind of a new medium. And uh, do, you, do, you, do you find yourself preaching common experience that this is going to be a communal experience? Yes. Well, yeah. that that too, and it's slightly destabilizing, and it's important in the context of expos and fairs to kind of think inwardly. So there's no, it's not an expo of something else. It's kind of an inward focus. Um, anyway, it took a lot, but we finally convinced them, and um, um, you know, then the authorities are um, uh, were trying to make us put a sprinkler system in this thing. You know, to because they treated it like a building, and we said, "Well, there's just there's nothing. There's no walls. There's this water. It's all the biggest sprinkler system in the world." But we had to fight. Well, was the that a long authority. conversation? It was a very. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, no, you know, you can't imagine. We had to prove how many gallons of water are dispersed over, you know, as if anything can combust. Anyway. Um, um, at the end, it, it, it ended up being um, an, an icon, you know, that represented Switzerland, and the Swiss embraced it at the very end as representing the Swiss doubt, um, <laughs> which is really beautiful. And it was, you know, on every label, on every on the stamps, on the you know billboards all over Switzerland, on the uh, Kirschwasser bottles, on every you know lottery tickets. It was it just became um, totally embraced as uh, representing something that we never intended. But um, you know, it's kind of like a machine to make meanings off of. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I think that when we, we find ourselves in kind of a crazy place, we jump off the cliff without a parachute usually, and then on the way down, we imagine how are we going to uh, save this one, and and then you know we've been successful. We take on projects where we where we feel like there's a possibility. I think that that's a, a big part of this is about the choice of, of what you choose to do because obviously you could choose to take fantastic you know kind of star architect commissions and do all that but you just you choose these I remember uh, your fellow artist in residence Chuck Close describing his art or his idea of art of, of getting in a problem and solving it that being the that's where the creativity and that relates a little bit to what you said about the work in it and the creativity the 99 percent perspiration um, let me ask you something about 
you know, the, you have a, a big office in New York. Lots of people work there. I've had the privilege of being there. When you see young architects uh, and, and people who want to work in the field coming up, do you sense changes in, in this new generation based on the things, the ideas that you have? I assume you, you, you bring people in mm -hmm. or like that. But just in general, the way the field progresses, uh, I'm always curious about this for reasons about citizen artists in general. Um, we talk about music schools. What kind of a musician? Are they citizen musicians or are they traditional, you know, we're going to get a job in an orchestra of musicians? What happens in architecture right now? What are people looking to do? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, we, I think we attract a um, certain kind of uh, architect that, that is interested in the work that we do. So first of all, um, we're a bunch of misfits and, <laughs> and um, you know, yeah. they're, they're, but are, are they trained that way, or do they? they <laughs> <laughs> I think that they just are not exactly comfortable uh, working for a big firm, um, and or, you know, we have our our firm is about eighty something people, and it's big enough that we we're able to do large civic-minded projects. So um, other firms that are big enough to do projects like that are none, are a little bit more commercial. I mean, we're not really commercial. Um, and so there's a very particular thing that we represent, and I think that um, people that choose to work for us target us. Um, but to, to speak to your question in a different way, I, I, I'm an educator also, and I teach at Princeton, and um, uh, I, I run the thesis, a master's thesis, and, and each semester I give the students a kind of broad theme. Usually it's one word um, that can span a lot of interests and or, or very terse term. And this, um, uh, this semester I gave call to action as the, as the, as the term. And the students had to put, uh, put their head around um, um, how can architecture um, play a role in, in culture a little bit more than just receiving inherited stuff. Um, could, it, uh, could it act, could it have agency? Um, and how to really make it relevant. And um, so there are something like uh, just 20 students um, that are thinking about this kind of thing. And I have to say that we'll see in, in the next month when the work totally comes out. But, it, you know, it's not, uh, it's kind of, ref there's a reference to the 60s, call to action. Um, well, what's the nearest um, uh, precedent that these students can really touch? And, and it is the 60s. And, um, and I think that what we're discovering is that there's a lot of restlessness right now uh, in this generation. They don't know exactly what the political message is. You know, they don't know exactly what they're after, but they know it's kind of it's a little bit like Occupy. You know, it's a kind of a sense of like it's not it's not perfectly right right now, and there's a lot to do, but we don't exactly know how to do it. Um, and uh, so I, I don't. It's not. It's not like the '60s, where there were um, very, very specific issues to re, uh, respond to, and then one could stand from the outside. I think that there is um, a sense that there is an unfinished mission of the '60s, um, yet with a kind of more complexity and working maybe inside and outside the system at the same time. Interesting. Well, you referenced, you know, politics, which brought me to where we where we are. We're in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to finish my questions just with two, two, two sections. One, just let's talk a little bit about the bubble, mm -hmm. uh, because that's been an ongoing project. And we actually had uh, Richard Kashalik here close to a year ago, yep. uh, talking about uh, the vision for this and you know, thrilling you know, it was to, <laughs> to have had the, the dry cleaning bag inflated. Uh, and the, you know, your sense of that as a, as a global cultural meeting place is the way I read it. It's about, you know, when you, when you put up all the flags that are around the Hirshhorn, and that's really the point. There's all of this international and national activity centered in one place, and to create spaces for that. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how that relates to, you know, your vision and your hopes for the, the bubble itself, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, we'll maybe go to questions after that. Okay. Um, well, I mean, for us, the, uh, the, the opportunity to work with Richard and Richard's mission when he took over the Hirshhorn um, was just a, you know, it was, again, it was just one of those alignments that couldn't be replicated. He, um, he realized that, uh, well, if you're going to show modern and contemporary art in, in, the, in Washington, uh, why not make it count that, that it's in Washington? It's not like any other 
um, arts institution anywhere outside of Washington, and, it's, and especially on the mall, you know, and the symbolic nature of the mall. Um, so the, the um, and his idea very much was to create a, a place of debate um, and of, of gathering, of intellectual gathering and debate around culture. Um, so when we stepped in, we, we were, we thought, well, that's, that's brilliant, that's fantastic. How can we make a space for it and how could we help represent it architecturally? And that's where, um, well, figuring out where it could be sited. It's a temporary um, installation and it, it gets rolled out. Um, the plan was originally twice a year, but now once a year for longer. Um, and where could it be? Well, it was the only space that was there was the hole uh, in the donut and a little bit outside. So the idea really came from the site and it came from the desire to not, uh, uh, well, we also had to make it really dismountable and because the Hirschhorn is um, uh, a, st a historic building that, uh, that you can't kind of uh, bolt into or nail into. But also uh, that whatever this architecture was, it was to represent um, freedom of speech and was to represent the, uh, a kind of supple, new, um, uh, I would say, uh, you know, maybe slightly iconoclastic uh, extension of the institution. And so it, 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 on the one hand, it's very loving with the Hirschhorn. It, it, it understands its site at the same time. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a different thing. And it's really designed to be a kind of uh, a partner to it. Um, and so uh, everything about the design of that building had to do with its intention, with its program, and being able to enable it and, uh, and kind of spark uh, conversation. Well, I think it certainly will do that. Uh, I think it's a it's an inspired design in a thousand ways, um, and the idea of uh, the visibility of it and the fact that it's going to have this its own dome mm -hmm. uh, is is thrilling in its own way. And I, I do wonder what uh, what all of the various you know constituencies we're talking about, all the foreign embassies, everything that's here will make of uh, of this in that context on the National Mall because mm -hmm. it is a, it is a large statement uh, in the context of D.C. Uh, yeah. And it's interesting because when you know, just um, thinking back to the '60s, the um, there, the inflatable their movement in a sense. There were several architects that were thinking about inflatables um, in that era because they were lightweight and they were transportable and uh, they were inexpensive. Um, and it's the in the evolution of the inflatable structure. Um, this really kind of plays a, a really interesting role, coming back to th some of the origins of the the, the lightness and the um, uh, the kind of spirit of um, uh, of kind of pushing the envelope. Um, at the same time, it's it's te technically it's a really hard feat to accomplish. And yeah, I, I'm dying to know exactly how that actually works, but maybe we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a separate section, because I do want to give uh, everybody a chance to uh, ask questions who'd like to. There's a microphone here, and uh, it'll be passed around, but if you're at the table, you should press your red button when you're called on so we can hear you, uh, and we'll start right here with Vicki Sant. It's really fun to hear you speak. I heard you before and totally enjoyed it. Um, you, your company is doing an art uh, education building at Stanford University right now and it's it's going to be a very very important building there because it's sort of redefining the entrance to the university which is iconic mm -hmm. and you said several things like the building makes the difference mm -hmm. um, and that you like to be edgy and so on tell me if, if I don't know if you're familiar with this particular building but it's the McMurtry art history Building. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, we're doing it. Yes. I know you are. But I, <laughs> you said there are 80 people in your firm. No, I'm familiar. And I'm wondering uh, how that's how your building there is going to change the school mm -hmm. and our education, which is on a real uh, increase there now in yeah. an exciting way. Yeah. Um, th I have to say that that um, has been a really complicated project. What it, what um, it it aspires to do is put. Um, uh, art production and art history together in one building, and um, and the form of it actually um, 
there, there are two legs that are kind of spiraling um, into each other with a kind of void space in the middle that is, and, and, a, and an accessible rooftop. Um, we, um, it's, it's, it's a building that's very different from the other buildings at, at Stanford, and which is the complexity of it, because there are certain design codes of Stanford that this building doesn't exactly fall into, although we have been somewhat restricted with a bit of, with a surface material. Um, but the, you know, I, I think that in general, the way that the building works is very, it's, there's a lot of visibility. There's a lot of, you know, from um, one part to the other that the play, places of like the studio art where artists are kind of typically on their own, they're much more exposed to others and to collaboration. Um, lab spaces and classrooms are much more exposed. Um, and I think it's, and also we try to make spaces that where the um, historians and the artists converge. And this is something that um, at, at Princeton where I teach, we, we, we um, try to have a very synthetic program where architects and architecture historians are. But that's not, in art schools, it, they're really, really different people. They're the guys that work with books and they're guys that work with paint. And, uh, and you know, we wanted to kind of break down those kind of conventions and, and the silos and really bring people together um, in the library and the cafe and in the, pub in the open spaces and, and so forth. So we're trying to do a little bit there. Thank you. Uh, great conversation. Uh, so one of the great challenges of our time is to figure out how do we make cities work, which means we have to bring changes to cities. And I guess it could be argued that New York City is one of the most progressive in the country right now in terms of change, things grand like you've been involved with, and things small and simple like returning the streets to pedestrians and other kinds of, of issues. Is the change that you've been a part of in New York unique to New York, or are there things we can learn from what you've done there and that, that can be applied elsewhere? Uh, also, could you identify yourselves when you, when you speak? Just so sure, my name is Ron Bogle. I'm president of the American Architectural Foundation. Um, well, I think that in a, in a sense, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's both. It's unique that we were able to do the work that we did there uh, because of the administration, I think. Um, I don't want to say it was entirely them because they, you know, there are a lot of really great leaders, other leaders in, in the city that really helped us on the High Line and, and, uh, and as well on Lincoln Center. Um, but the administration had a lot to do with it, uh, set, uh, setting um, uh, these kind of civic goals, uh, public space, as, as really big goals for the, um, for the administration. And, and they've really, um, having a great cultural um, uh, commissioner that was, uh, and it's unique, it's unique that Bloomberg was able to get the commissioners and, and the kind of, um, the brains around these projects, not typical bu uh, government bureaucrats, okay? Very, very open-minded and action-oriented and non-political. I mean, I, I really want to emphasize that. It was, you know, that's the thing that defines this administration is that, you know, one is able to kind of move through things, somebody has a good idea, and you kind of get to it and get started. Um, but I think that there are, um, you know, we're uh, being asked to look at other places, uh, different parts of the world, that have been uh, um, affected by some of the work that we've done, and also, you know, not not just us, but you know, there has been a spirit of change in other cities, um, and of public parks, gathering spaces, and so forth. And um, we really see that that there is, you know, there's there's stuff afoot. You know, there's there's so much to be done, um, but uh, but there are many cities that are starting to rethink themselves. But it, it takes it does take a kind of alignment of um, you know this this economically this is like a hard era to actually take those kinds of initiatives um, and for um, for the leaders that really you know are um, you know care to do that and and really make that an, an emphasis you know it's 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 that much harder but I think that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of mobility right now there's a lot of um, new thinking. I'm, I'm Lisa Gold. I'm the director of Washington Project for the Arts. Um, I think you've done amazing things. I'm just I'm curious about um, the call to action mm -hmm. um, that you gave to your students in this idea. Do you, what what kind of spaces do you look to for inspiration? What are the more successful things that you've seen in the world, whether they're ant colonies or beautiful spaces? Like what do you, what inspires you? Oh, wow, mind? wow. 
Uh, God, that is really a hard question. Um, you know, I I don't know. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's that's you know I. Um, you know, I, I mean, we don't, there, you know, I can't, I, I, maybe it would be inappropriate um, for me not to speak about specifically architectural projects, but, you know, I mean, I'm really affected by by open public spaces, you know, that I see all over the world and all over Europe. I mean, they've been successful forever. You know, um, a very, very specific uh, model for Culture Shed, for example, and, and some of our projects do have some kind of models uh, occasionally, uh, is the Grand Palais. Um, I mean, here's a building that was, you know, that, that was never really conceived to be there forever and ever, and it's being translated um, into something that um, uh, is not exclusively for art or exclusively for commerce. It's something in between, and it's really a kind of model for Culture Shed, not only physically, but uh, uh, but uh, in terms of its business model. Um, and let's see, uh, you know, I think spaces that are misused you know, like that are used for the wrong purposes. I mean, I just, um, you know, any kind of ad hoc things. You know, even, I, this is really uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, something that's surprising, but the favelas um, in Rio, I mean, really horrific living conditions, but there's something really um, beautiful about the informal spaces that are built from ground up, um, as opposed to uh, from you know to the way that uh, that typically these things are done from the top down you know and uh, kind of anti institutional models um, and it's interesting to see some of the more progressive um, actions that are taking place in favelas where they're being brought into um, in urban infrastructure and yet there's a kind of preservation of the feel and the scale of some of those spaces but with real amenities um, and with you know kind of acceptance into the culture. Anyway, I'll keep thinking. <laughs> Statue of Liberty, by the way, my favorite building. The inside. <laughs> Hi, my name is Scott Kratz. I'm wearing two hats today. I work at the National Building Museum, but then I'm also working with the Office of Planning and a local nonprofit here to transform an old freeway bridge over the Anacostia River into an activated park. So your High Line has been really inspirational. And that's really my question. Um, Given this, as you mentioned, that the High Line has been so inspirational to um, people thinking across the United States and the world about transforming infrastructure, and now that the High Line has been so successful, what, four million visitors a year, I think? Mm -hmm. um, what lessons have you learned going through that process now that you're about to open up stage three? Or what surprises um, did you not anticipate that are currently informing your, your current work? Well, some surprises on the High Line that are actually having us rethink the, the very um, success of the High Line <laughs> is, um, is the unanticipated crowds. You know, we had no idea that it would have taken um, so, uh, so well. And what we argued initially, um, and uh, us and, and uh, the friends of the High Line, that this would be a catalyst for development, which you have to actually do to get any funding and any interest. Um, it's in a part of Manhattan that's really, you know, uh, full of uh, parking lots, sea of open parking lots and and um, industrial buildings that are really need to be rethought. But um, in any case, we uh, um, yeah, we didn't realize how uh, the development would be, you know, how how um, successful it would be for development. And in fact. Um, a lot of those sites were flipped over and over, and their um, value continued to escalate. And now um, they're starting to be built on, and uh, the crowds are mounting. And New Yorkers go to the High Line on weekdays, right? Not on weekends. Um, it it's just too um, it's just too popular. And and so I think that that um, that question of this is an alternative park. At what point is success a bad thing? You know, and uh, and I think that it will self-regulate. It will self-edit after you know. It's still very uh, novel right now in Section Three. It will be a couple of years until that happens, and the novelty will it will just become a part of New York, um, and hopefully it will continue to be popular. But um, it won't be as much of a frenzy uh, there as possible. So uh, you know, I, I, I it's just a really uh, balancing act. There's no way to win because when we were arguing for the High Line initially. Um, even with the community to say this is a great amenity for the community, 
um, a, a, bl a great place to just hang out and be there. Um, and now the community is saying, wow, it's just overcrowded, and um, you know, where, where do we belong in all of this? Um, there's just no way to win, you know? It's very hard to figure it out. That's interesting, because uh, there was just news this week that on the third section, we talked about this earlier, and it's a developing story, obviously. They're going to, uh, in anticipation of the work you're going to do, they've, they've uh, put an artist, Carol Bove, is going to put some things, and they were going to charge admission, uh, $6, to be able to go to this undone section. Uh, and, you know, some regulations about that. But today's New York Times, they've rescinded that. And we tried to speculate exactly ex why that is. But do you see a situation someday where perhaps there is admission to the High Line? Admission? No, I I can't. It's a it's a city park um, officially. It is officially. It's officially it's well, a city park. It, it, I think that you know we were trying to figure out um, because my studio didn't really even know about it. Um, uh, I imagine that it's because of um, you know human escorts that need to actually take people out because it's still toxic. It hasn't been remediated. Um, there are certain areas that you can touch and you can't touch, and so um, the High Line actually is having a hard time. Uh, fulfilling its campaign for Section 3. So while we try to do that, we try to make some a areas accessible. It's an interesting uh, dilemma in, a, in another way because I'm not sure it was entirely clear, but Culture Shed was at the end of Section 3 or along the way of Section 3? or It's, it's right at the knuckle where... The knuckle. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's, uh, the High Line is predominantly north-south, and at yeah. uh, 30th Street, it kind of rounds out. It hangs a left. Yeah, it hangs a left toward the river, and, and then it goes around the Hudson Yards, and then down. And um, so it's just at that moment where it takes the curve. So it's officially on 30th Street. Um, but what's really great about um, the location is um, that while it's in a new development that will be really massive and very dense and uh, it's a little scary, um, it actually has about 300 feet of continuous um, uh, frontage onto the High Line. Mm. So it's very much connected to, to the park. And, and for us, we're also, so the, the big kind of dark secret here is we're also doing a residential tower that is, was featured in that animation. We took that on to defend uh, the culture shed because we've, somebody had to be attached to it and there are some, um, there's some shared infrastructure there. Um, and so, um, but, but what we realize is that, uh, that we could really uh, control a kind of ensemble of elements, a cultural building, a residential building, and a park that are all in proximate relationship. Conductor. Yeah. 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 Nice. <laughs> nice. A Please. Uh, mic microphone will come to you. I'm Flo Stone with the Environmental Film Festival. I wondered about, uh, we show the film about your work in the festival this year, but I wondered about how you start a project because what, what interests me so much about your work is the creativity and the originality of it and its ability to affect both a perfect person alone and very large groups. Uh, a person alone is very comfortable, but, but you can go in a large group. But that moment of creativity when you're, when you're deciding something like this, mm -hmm. uh, how do you work? Is it the three of you that really discuss it? I, uh, do you work with a group of your architects? I mean, how, how do you get at the kernel of what you want to do? Um, so, so very often, uh, we just we take the problem uh, and we just kind of um, let it stew for a long time. Um, so there's a part of the work that's analytical, where we just try to understand what the circumstances are, what the site is, what um, you know, what we're what we're trying to do, kind of agendas that we have that are ongoing. Um, uh, like for example, visuality. This this project is part of a kind of research on the culture of vision that permeates a lot of our projects and uh, in, independent projects and and uh, and commission projects uh, for public space. Um, but at the same time, you know, there so there's there's that stuff which is very rational and can be discussed and uh, uh, with a with a group of people. But then there's the whatever, you know, some inspiration, and that you know is totally unpredictable, and it comes in a sketchbook and happens in the middle of the night, and you can't exactly uh, predict when and how. Um, so I think we, we would like to kind of put put those things together. And as for working in a collaborative team, um, Rick Charles and I um, basically um, are all 
uh, designers, and we're all working on all the projects at the same time. And um, we just fight for ideas. And uh, you know, whoever has the best idea wins. And usually, it's a bloody mess, and uh, we fight a lot. And <laughs> And, 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 and often ideas kind of percolate from the bottom up. You know, some of the y youngster, you know, 18-year-old that's an intern might have something, you know, and, and then we riff on that. And, and so it's a very kind of collaborative uh, process in the studio. But sometimes these things just, you know, they they're just come out. And I, this thing just, it was, it was on the water. Uh, we were asked to imagine uh, an expo building um, on the water. And we just had to make a cloud. I don't know why, it just, it had to happen. It had to be that the architectural material predominantly had to be of the water, on the water, about the water, and, uh, and it, it just ended up being, uh, you know, be, being able to be realized. But, um, but it, you know, couldn't, uh, we couldn't have come up with that in another place, another set of circumstances. So everything we do is very site-specific and is born out of those set of circumstances, site and situation specific. Okay, perhaps one more question. Uh, thank you. I'm Glenn Marcus. I made a couple of documentaries on public spaces. But most importantly, my mother-in-law was the first female head of the American Institute of Architects. Wow. She can build with steel. She had to be made of steel for that. <laughs> um, my question is, can you give us an example uh, of a time that you didn't compete for a commission or turned down a commission or stopped before completing a commission based on political concerns? Hmm. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. No. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of an example where. Um, uh, you know, I can't. I can't really come up with an example where we were turned down. Uh, there, there were there were projects that um, that didn't that didn't happen because they were in a wrong fundraising climate. Uh, there was, oh, well, actually, okay, I can give you an example. Um, uh, we were, um, we won a competition in Scotland to do a uh, town square, and it was, uh, it was um, in, a, in an area, in a, in a town, and I'm just like, I'm blanking on the name of the town. Um, and there was a, um, a high-speed road uh, right at, that went through the middle of town, and a train, and a very small, uh, uh, green space, and um, there was uh, Aberdeen, and Aberdeen, how could I forget? Um, and um, we won a commission, it was a hard-fought uh, competition to, uh, to, to uh, imagine how that space could be turned into a more, uh, a bigger civic space. It was hardly used, um, and, um, and, and the intention was to put not only green space and enlarge the park, but also bring in um, visual arts and, and performing arts out, out of outdoor spaces and, and one kind of uh, a gallery. Um, and we, um, there, was a, there was one very, very uh, big donor who was a major person in the oil industry there. And, uh, and he was giving, um, uh, I think, 80 million pounds for the for the project, and it was b basically supported by him. Um, the town was very very um, suspicious about uh, taking money from a billionaire, and um, and really just um, there was a lot of controversy in the town as to whether uh, to um, to take the money or not, and and uh, you know because there was suspicion that once it got into the hands of a billionaire the whole town would just go to pot, and they would all be developed, and there would be bad office buildings right in the middle of town, and you know, just all of that stuff that comes with development. His intention was actually to kind of boost the town, but by, by giving it a great public space. So I think he was very authentic with this. Um, we just uh, won by a margin of 1% in the, in the vote, um, and the project was um, going forward until the political situation changed. You know, the, the old government um, kind of expired, the new government, there was a new election, and they basically re reversed, there was a, actually a, a referendum that put the project in place. They reversed the referendum, and, um, and, and the project is not going forward, and that money is being lost, mm -hmm. and that project is being lost. And, you know, I, I, could, I could say that there was, nothing, there was nothing that any citizen in that town 
could or should be objecting to. It's all really good and it's all positive and it's all the kinds of things that, that citizens want. It was just the, um, a kind of fear of big money that, uh, that really killed the project. Well, that's a, a less than optimistic note to end on because that can happen. But why don't we just bring it around to say that all the things that you, you are doing and have been doing are really bearing fruit. I mean, people are, I mean, as much as the High Line is overcrowded, it's overcrowded with people who are finding inspiration at it. Lincoln Center, new generations of artists are going to work there. New audiences are going. Occupy is trying to get in. That's good. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I'm struck by my, my last thought was when you talked about vision. And that really is what you're doing. You're guiding our vision. That one shot of the, that study space, I guess it is, at the ICA in Boston where you just see straight down into the water and you train our vision. It's not even so much about what you show us, about what you don't show us. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the blur building as well. You took away things. And uh, it's an incredible thing to see through your eyes. Oh, thank it's beautiful. you. beautiful. So thank, thank you so you. much for joining us. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you for another roundtable soon.